A while back, I came across a tattered copy of a 50-year-old scientific journal. As I flipped through it, I expected to see pages of texts and graphs, and I found those. But I also saw something a little more unusual. It was a line drawing, like a piece of art, but it was also a game. Do you want to see for yourself and play along? The rules are simple. I'm going to show you that drawing I found for just a moment. Your job is to tell me what you see first. Ready? What did you see? Well, the first time I opened that journal, I saw a horse's head. Odds are you did too, about 80% of people do. But are you sure that's all that was there? The caption beneath the drawing in that journal told me there was another possibility for what I might see. Did you find it the first time around? Did you see the seal? It's actually there too. What's going on with our perception here? Why does this happen? The answers to these questions will help you to understand why we don't all see all that's really there in the line drawing. But the answers will also offer insights into things like polarization and public opinion, why we struggle to eat healthy, how we can slow drivers down who are speeding where children play, and how to exercise more efficiently. So to get back to that question about differences in perception, Let's consider two basic mechanics of how vision works that complicates our ability to see everything and see it well. Here's the first point about vision. Our eyes are positioned on the front of our faces and they point forward. This makes it hard for us to see all of our surroundings unless we move our head and point our eyes somewhere else. Take, for example, a horse. Not the one from the line drawing in that old journal, but a real one. Evolution led horses to have eyes positioned on the sides of their heads so that they can watch for and avoid predators. As a result, their field of view is 70% bigger than ours. And here's the second point about vision. We can only see the details of about 2% of what our eyes take in. That's the equivalent of the surface area of two of our thumbs on our outstretched arms. These two points taken together mean that we can't always see all that's actually there. We have a visual information deficiency. Now, that horse seal line drawing is a cute party trick, but as soon as we take these same ideas and apply them to situations with real consequences, the fun and games end. Take this example. Just after midnight a while back, Los Angeles police officers detected a car speeding. When they tried to pull the driver over, he didn't stop. Eventually, the police had the car cornered and they ordered everyone out. When the driver got out, four officers swarmed, tasered, and beat him. At this point, a bystander started filming the incident. By the end, the driver had sustained fractured facial bones, a broken ankle, brain damage, and kidney failure. The driver, as you might have guessed, was Rodney King a taxi driver who had been drinking with his friends while watching a basketball game that night. And as you might also know, none of those four officers on trial for assault and use of excessive force were found guilty in the case. If you're like me, when you watch the video footage of that encounter, you see what looks like an extreme and brutal response to what appears to be an uncooperative but nonviolent individual. Others saw it that way too and were baffled by the differences in visual experience that jury had. Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley said, the jury's verdict will not blind us to what we saw on that videotape. President George H.W. Bush also said, when viewed from outside the trial, it's hard to understand how that jury's verdict could possibly square with the videotape. People asked back then, and still do today, why didn't that jury see the video the way the mayor, the president, or the public did? People puzzled over society's polarized interpretations of what seemed like objective visual evidence documenting what happened. Groups of people were so certain that what they saw was right, even when those interpretations were so drastically different from one another. It's like that horse seal visual illusion again, but with much higher stakes. Now, I don't have firsthand experience of what Rodney King and members of racial minority groups go through, but I have been studying biases in human judgment for 20 years. I've asked and answered the same question over and over again. 
Why don't we all see the same thing the same way? The answers are complex and include historic, systemic, and individual racism, sexism, classism, social hierarchy, and other forms of bias and discrimination. Research shows, and I personally believe, that this societal backdrop unjustly nudges us towards more favorable evaluations of law enforcement than suspects, particularly when those suspects are black and brown. These complex social issues bear directly on the roots of polarization, but also indirectly through the ways in which we see the evidence in any particular situation. I've seen this over and over again in my research. It's a classic case of our eyes playing tricks on us. The reason why we don't all see the same thing the same way is that what our eyes look at may not in fact be what our brains see or more accurately, what our brains remember. It turns out that any attempts to see actually involves memories. What we see is informed not only by what's present, but also by what we already remember and believe to be true. Albert Einstein can help to explain. We're looking at the front of his face, right? Not quite. We think we're seeing his face. But as it rotates around, we realize we're actually peering inside the back of a hollow mask. When I first saw this, I asked myself, how could this be happening? What I discovered is that we have a lifetime of experience seeing hundreds of thousands of other people's faces. We remember what a face looks like. It's just that relying on our memory to see will lead us to the wrong conclusion about what we're really looking at here. Because we rely on our memory to see, any two people with different memories might come to see the very same thing in very different ways. The question then is, can we align what we perceive with what's actually present? When we have all the evidence, the answer is yes, we can. To understand how, check out this video. It's taken from a dashboard camera on a police cruiser. It's low resolution, yes but it's the kind of video evidence that jurors often see in trials. Imagine you're a juror. Do you think the officer should be disciplined for use of excessive force? Watch it again. And this time, focus your attention on the civilian's hands. Did you see something you hadn't seen the first time? Maybe now you saw the civilian pass something from one hand to the other, swallow the evidence, and bite the officer's hand. Now, having seen this, did your opinion about the officer's use of force change? For many people, it did, and my research team discovered why. We found that when people focused more attention on the civilian, they gained a different perspective and understanding of what happened. This change in perspective didn't make them all believe that the officer's actions were appropriate. Instead, it increased agreement about whether the officer's use of force was excessive. The polarization was eliminated. By researching these questions, I'm not trying to excuse police from bearing responsibility for their actions, especially since in this case, the civilian died while in police custody. Instead, what I'm saying is that understanding how visual attention changes judgment can bring insight. If you understand how visual attention works to inform your opinions, you can take agency over your decisions. You can become a more informed and empowered person. Let me give you a more concrete example of the consequential power of visual attention. Think about your local supermarket. What appears on the shelves at eye level? Well, you might not be able to come up with an answer. Marketers sure can, because they know that the products they place at eye level are more likely to sell. In one study, supermarket managers placed fresh produce near the checkouts and saw the sales of dark green and bright yellow vegetables increase by 30% and fruit sales increased by 70%. But having healthy foods in our line of sight is not all that common. 
Displays near checkouts often include the kinds of junk foods you might be trying to cut back on. Marketers know how to manipulate your attention. And lawyers do too. Lawyers defending the police in the Rodney King case stopped the video of the assault at each frame. Along with experts, they told the jury where to look, what to see, and as a result, what to believe. It's as if those lawyers took that horse seal drawing from the old journal and showed people only the bottom left corner so that all they could see were the features of the seal's face. In doing so, they turned off people's ability to see the horse and persuaded them that the right image to see is the seal and the horse, the wrong one. This is just an analogy, but in actuality, the lawyers did take away the independence of jurors' perceptual experiences and perhaps even created a division between what the jurors perceived and what was actually present. Many of us may never find ourselves in a jury debating these kinds of visuals, but we might have an experience like this one. What would you do if you were driving and saw this? If your knee-jerk reaction is anything like mine, you'd slam on the brakes. But the thing is, we don't really have to. Because it's actually a clever illusion painted on the road by British Columbia's nonprofit group Preventable as a part of a public safety campaign meant to slow drivers on residential streets. To a passing motorist, it looks like a child. But a pedestrian will see it for what it really is. With a shift in perspective, what we see and what we do is different. The visual illusion to the motorist quickly and dramatically changes their actions, but a change in perspective brings a more accurate understanding of the situation. But seeing differently is challenged by a basic human tendency towards confirmation bias. When we're testing whether we're right, we look for information that supports our beliefs rather than refutes them. We do this with our eyes, too. In fact, that's what you can observe here. The red dots are from eye tracking technology that tell us where and for how long a person is looking. On the left, the red dots show us where that person looked when watching the video for the first time. On the right, that's when they watched it again. The patterns are the same. Even when we have a chance to look more, we fail to gain a new perspective. Unless we look differently, we don't ever see the things that we didn't see the first time. So if we want to align what we perceive and what's actually present, we need to look for the things that we don't naturally see. We can do this through something called visual framing. We can intentionally look at our surroundings in ways that give us a new and more informed perspective. Lorraine O'Grady knew this intuitively. She's a black American artist who, as a part of New York City's African American Day Parade in 1983, placed a giant gold frame on top of a float. On the base, she painted the words, art is, dot, 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 and drove around the streets of Harlem. People along the parade route shouted, frame me, and we're the art. The work brought attention to issues of racial inequality. It was a democratization of art, said Stephanie Sparling Williams, then a fellow at the Yale University Art Gallery. 40 years or so later, the day the media networks announced Joe Biden as America's next president, his team collaborated with O'Grady to release this video. It featured gold frames surrounding people, moments, places, and jobs representing all walks of American life with the goal of soothing a divided nation. Back in 1983, O'Grady commented, I guess I didn't understand what the power of a frame and a camera were. O'Grady may have only sensed that visual frames can shift our perspective when we need it most, but she and our nation sure know it now. Her perspective is shared by other accomplished individuals in entirely different contexts. In conversations I've had with Olympic runners as a part of my research, I discovered that they too use visual framing when they're racing to the finish line. Where do you think they look? Personally, I thought they'd be looking all around to see how far ahead or behind they were compared to other runners, but they don't. Instead, they focus on the finish line. We can all adopt the Olympians' visual techniques to help us meet our own athletic goals. I found in my research that people who focused their attention on interesting things in their neighborhood 
took 85% more steps, and traveled 60% farther each time they went out for a walk. And they did it even though the amount of time they spent walking was the same. By intentionally directing their visual focus, they increased the efficiency of their exercise. You can teach yourself to direct your visual frame, and when you do, you too might walk farther and faster than you thought you could. So, is visual framing the solution to all of society's ills? Probably not. The scope of our problems is vast and deep. Polarization is pulling at the already thin threads that hold society together. Over the last 40 years, the United States has seen polarization rise at rates that have outpaced every other country tested, according to a study conducted in 2020 by researchers at Stanford and Brown universities. Over the years, we've grown even more fond of the people who share our views and even more opposed to those who don't. But to address big problems, we need to form a united front. We can't solve problems when we as a society are divided about whether we see a problem in the first place. The lawyers defending the police in the Rodney King assault trial used visual framing to show the jury a different perspective than what they might have seen on their own. I believe the lawyers used visual framing to hide evidence of a problem, and legal scholars agreed. They've argued that framing saved the officers from conviction. Visual framing can lead to misinformation, as it seems it did here. But framing does more than give rise to injustice because knowledge is power. Framing can promote a more informed perspective. By conscientiously working to visually frame all of our surroundings in ways that don't come naturally, you can override your individual bias and regain control of a process that might otherwise leave you manipulated by other people, and even by yourself. You can see what you may not have seen before, and with new information, you can get a broader and more informed perspective. The solution to polarization starts with each of us, individually. If we gain a fuller, richer, more accurate understanding of what's really out there, if we can perceive all of what is present, we can start to close the space separating us from them. And that is how we can start to build a bridge to connect our divided society. Thank you.